Classically Trained, Episode 8. Welcome to another episode of the Classically Trained Podcast. I'm your host, John D. Harrison, and thank you for joining me. Today's episode is really exciting for me. It is an interview that I had the opportunity to do with a gentleman by the name of Curtis Fletcher. And he's been described as a creative problem solver who combines science and art. So his approach is one that uses both the left brain and the right brain thinking, combining this creative but also a very structured process approach. In fact, he describes himself as part wizard, part warrior poet, and part wise guy. So he's worked in a variety of different roles, ranging from CTO to VP of strategy. He's worked as a web designer to director of marketing operations. So he has a wide variety of different skills that he brings to his approach when consulting with businesses and organizations, as well as past experience he's had with redesigning the actual customer's experience. And he's done so with corporations such as Corporate Express, Ariba, Oracle, Artemis, and Compassion International. So without much more introduction, let's jump right into today's interview with Curtis Fletcher. I'd like to say a special welcome to my guest today, Curtis Fletcher. Welcome. How are you doing this afternoon? Uh, it's a good afternoon for me so far, especially since for me it's still morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really excited to have a chance to spend some time with you at this moment, being able to uh, discuss ideas around the concepts of leadership, but also touch in some metaphor and some analogy that often can be overlooked. I think there's great power in that. And one of the things I'm most interested in is understanding what are ideas, what are life lessons that individuals can take away from video games. Is there any particular lesson or idea that you yourself have found inspiration for within video games? Oh, I mean, that's a pretty broad question, right? They're all over the board. I use analogies from gaming in my work. Uh, I work as a both a, a management and a software consultant. And so predominantly what we focus on is helping companies create a better customer experience. And in, in that regard, there are examples from gaming all the time. I've been in software design back in the day. And in that field, there are examples from gaming all the time. Not just the parallels between designing business software and gaming software, but the notion of human interaction with the software itself. As you and I have talked, you know that I've, I've even drawn parenting analogies and parenting lessons from gaming and understanding what my kids get out of gaming that is well beyond just the escape or the kind of narcissistic numbing that we think, you know, we stereotypically yeah, think gaming sure. is about. So yeah, I mean, there are lessons everywhere that you can pull out of the gaming arena. Uh, and there are sometimes I wonder if game designers were ahead of us in that. And they knew that, and so they built games to touch us in that way, or if we're just responding to saying, hey, there's more here than meets the eye. You know, I think you're really onto something, though. As a, uh, as a media, video games offer an experience that approaches a level of interaction that you don't see in movies uh, and, and provides the ability to deliver music. It provides the ability to connect with emotion, especially as uh, in recent years we've seen the technology take us to a point where the visuals really connect. I mean, if you look back at the early gaming systems, you had to use your imagination a bit. I, I don't know. What what would you say? I, I know you're a bit of a gamer. What were some of your early gaming memories? What games got you started? You know, I'm old enough to remember when the, the coolest video game was two rectangles beating a square back and forth. And uh, right. only two sound effects, ping and pong, right? Mm -hmm. But we got really into the Atari system. Early and and for me this was you know high school going into college and I can remember remember this is pre cell phone too so I can remember trying to get my little brother on the phone when I'm in between college classes throwing an idea at him on how we were going to solve the Indiana Jones puzzle in the Atari game and saying you have to wait till I get home to try this so here's a college kid calling a nine year old at home saying, dude, I've got an idea. We could totally fix this. We could totally make this work. And, 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 you know, back in the day, your character was a four-pixel square for a head and maybe, you know, two more pixels of a different color on top of it to represent a hat. And, and by way of just kind of suggestion, when I first saw Minecraft and my kids were playing it, I walked in and said, oh, dude, what is this? This is throwback to high school. 
what are the, what's with these <laughs> graphics? You're totally losing it. Now I'm now I'm really into the game. But when I first saw it, it was that throwback to Atari for me. So sure. we started a lot with the puzzle games. But in the Atari day, you were you were playing anything because it was really all pretty the same. If you were playing basketball or football or soccer or any of the sports games, it was just kind of some you know disconnected squares touching each other in the corner, moving back and forth across the screen. Then you had the you know the kind of the classic arcade games where you were shooting stuff, and then you had the puzzle games like the Indiana Jones thing. But graphically, they all looked the same. It was just moving the stuff across the screen and. Trying to figure out where which which square to try and land him in. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny as you mentioned that. Um, I know an area of great interest and expertise for you is leadership, and um, my background is in organizational development. So I get a chance to work with leaders a lot, and, and helping them connect. And I couldn't help but think and and listen. It almost seems like there's some parallels as you're talking about this idea of nostalgia, of communication, of connecting to solve issues. It's just interesting. I, I don't know that this idea has been fully explored in gaming. Um, if you could take a leadership problem or challenge that you've encountered and have a video game solve it, you don't have to design the game, but what issue do you wish could be fixed <laughs> <laughs> in a way that would be much more engaging than the way we currently try solving? If I pick one, right? One of the, one of the mm-hmm. challenges I think that leaders have is that is it is typically easier to establish a goal, put a um, forecast out there, and try and motivate people to hit the goal by saying, hey, we should do this. Um, it's easier as a leader to manage a process that's going to lead you to that goal. What's really difficult is figuring out what motivates each of your different people. And one of the things that I think gaming provides, and, and it, it kind of goes across genres, is feedback mechanisms that help you understand what are, what's motivating people. So you can get people within the same game that are trying to solve a puzzle or people within the same game that are just trying to collect treasure or people within the same game that are trying to beat one particular baddie, right? I find that even when I game with my own kids, when we're playing multiplayer games, you find one of the other guys kind of wandering off and you're going, what are you doing? I'm trying to accomplish this goal. I needed your help. You're wandering off. Well, I I saw this clue and it's going to solve the puzzle I was trying to solve. Yeah, that's not our current objective. The, the gaming platform creates those on-the-fly mechanisms that helps you determine people's motivation. And in a leadership context, that sets you up to be able to, to kind of rejigger expectations as you try and get people all aligned in moving towards the same goal. And so if there were ways that we could utilize that kind of gaming concept in building into our processes, those feedback loops, those mechanisms that help us measure motivation, And not just measure, but determine and allow people some free range to move toward their motivation without fear of retribution, right? Um, Why are you wasting time at your desk? I needed you working on this forecast. That would really help us align everybody as we move towards our our common business goals. Am I making sense there? Yeah, I'm totally tracking there. What I'm curious is in the exceptions that you've seen in the business world, the exceptions where there are those who, who really get it. Have you noticed any common threads or, or anything that stands out in helping them make that leap from the situation you described to a team that operates with that clarity? I think what I the, the theme that I see pretty commonly in unified teams that are able to set aside kind of personal side goals, the theme that I see pretty consistently is trust in the leader. Mm. And so if I know that you're going to take me through this section of business, and I'm using that, I'm using that language very specifically to parallel gaming. If I know that you're going to take me through this section of business to accomplish accomplish our team goal, but you also understand my personal goal and you're going to help me accomplish that, that leadership trust is, I think, what aligns teams and allows them to function uh, more consistently and, and more cohesively towards that common goal. Even as I say that, I, there's a bunch of notes that I want to write down. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going, wait a minute, yeah, here's the here's the connections to that, right? So when I'm, back to a gaming parallel, when I'm learning a new game from someone who's already played it, and I get tempted to be sidetracked, if I know that they're going to lead me to this goal, but it's not going to create a situation where I can't go back and do the rest of the level, then I trust them and I'm going to follow them. And that the same thing applies in, in, in business. If I, as a leader, can make sure that my team trusts that I've got their best intentions and their goals in mind as well, then they're going to follow me to the corporate goal, and then we're going to find ways to achieve those personal goals on the side as well. How would you recommend individuals, whether they're at a leadership level or even at a staff level, work on what you just described? You you mentioned this idea of communicating intentions and directions, and, and I think often as business professionals, it's easy to be misunderstood 
whether it's our motives or our intentions, what advice do you have for individuals and leaders looking to communicate their intentions to others? Uh, I'm going to answer that in two ways. One, you have to clearly state what the objective is for us as an organization, right? So here's the goal. Here's how I think we're going to accomplish it. But you still have that side piece, that trust piece, right? So how do I really make sure that people trust me when we're going to go accomplish this goal? Now, if we're talking just about communicating the goal, I can recommend a communications conference that I'm on the staff of that uh, occurs twice a year, the SCORE conference, free commercial. That really helps you hone that communication so that you're clear in what you're stating. But on that trust end, there are a couple of exercises that I can recommend too. There's actually a, a, um, a question that I ask everyone who reports to me that has become known in some organizations as, has Curtis asked you the question yet? Uh, and the question that I ask is if you could do anything in the world to make a living, no limitations. You could go back in time, forward in time, be a man, be a woman, be faster, stronger, heavier, lighter, whatever. If you could do anything to make a living, what would you do? And then I interrogate that question. And when we get to what motivates them, which is my intent with asking the question, I then ask them to do something that's really counterintuitive. What I ask them to do is trust me to help them find that. Because what I'll tell them is, look, if, if this isn't the job, if the job you're in today is not that thing, then I know that you have a part of your energy focused on your current job and a part of your energy focused on finding that thing. And so what I ask you to do counterintuitively is I ask you to be a rock star at what you're doing today and trust me to find that other thing. Because mm. if you're a rock star and together we find that other thing, then I can recommend you as a rock star. If you're 50-50, then the best I can do when we find that other thing is say, yeah, they're pretty good. And what we found in organizations uh, where I've done that is that we're able to move people pretty frequently into jobs that are a closer match to what they exactly want to do. And so multiple, multiple layers of benefit are happening. First, they're trusting me to lead them to our corporate goal because they know that I know what they want to do. They're trusting me to find that next position for them. And that means that they're going to trust me when I state this goal and they're going to help me accomplish it, help our team accomplish it. What also happens is it helps them articulate what it is that they want to do. And if they're taking me up on my challenge to be a rock star in what they do today, our organization moves forward faster. I mean, the parallel to gaming is obvious, right? If I'm leading a bunch of guys across a battlefield and I'm saying, look, I've played this game before, trust me. And we'll come back and do that side adventure. If they trust me, we're going to accomplish that together a whole lot faster. And that is, that, I mean, that is a one-to-one -one business parallel right yeah, there. Yeah. Well, even as you're talking about that, I, I think back to some of the earlier games and, and the lack of sophistication. Uh, I've been a big fan of the Final Fantasy series. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at outset, you look at role-playing games like Final Fantasy or Star Tropics or Legend of Zelda. They didn't exactly give you a lot of direction. You, you spend a lot of your time just wandering around trying to figure out what on earth am I supposed to do. And, uh, and as we've progressed, you find that the games, you know, some, some criticism involved, but have become more linear in that regard. But not necessarily linear. They might have just gotten better at explaining exactly what it is you need to do, who needs to be with you as you're doing it, and what you're going to use to accomplish it. And you see a much higher level of success and a lot less waste involved in that situation, which, you know, I, I can't think of a project in the workplace that I've been a part of that couldn't benefit from having clearer objectives and less waste. Right. right. And I mean, that, man, now you're really going to get me riffing on all the parallels here because you bring into the, you bring into um, the equation, the notion of choice, right? How much choice should I give you versus making it strictly linear? I think as humans, we want choice, but too much choice paralyzes us. So for me, uh, Skyrim was a total failure. There was way too much choice right from the beginning. Am I going to be good or bad? Am I going to be a lizard or a bird or a dude or, you know? And then once I make that decision, uh, I'm not really sure what to do when I'm running off down the hill. And do I collect this thing? Am I going to need that later? How much can I hold? The game hasn't really told me. I'm going to have to learn by experience. All cool. All choice, for me, way too much choice. I stopped playing the game, right? Yeah. Not enough direction. I, I saw there's actually, as if there weren't enough choices, there was a, a mod that was created for the PC version where you could unlock even more customizable <laughs> options. And I think it took the number of unique combinations up to close to 300,000 just before you even determine your character type. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, talking about paralysis by analysis right. there, you just, that's a big commitment. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, there, is, there are, are product studies today, and I, I wish I could pull one up on my machine, but I've looked at them, 
that show really if you give humans too many options, if you give people too many options in a product, they end up choosing nothing. If you give them two options, they choose one all the time. And, and so you think about that in terms of a product offering or in terms of a career path for people, figuring out that right number of options and then communicating them clearly uh, is a really important concept in not only leading people that work for you, but leading your customers as well. That's really important. Uh, let me change gears a bit sure. and ask for you uh, something that's a little more personal in your own leadership journey. Um, has there been one particular idea or habit that you'd describe as a game changer? I would go, it doesn't change gears that much because I would go back to that notion of understanding my people well enough to know what they want to accomplish. The very first time that I was ever put in a position of management where I was asked to create a group and then lead them, uh, I had had some leadership roles before that uh, as a team captain or um, working in church or, or being a volunteer at the church. But this was the first time I was in a corporate leadership role. I just kind of semi-intuitively, I guess, asked my team, "What do you want, where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in three years? And where do you want to be in five years? And what can I do to help you get there? Hmm. And I found it was really interesting that one of the guys on the team said, in three years, I want to be in your job. And the rest of the team kind of went, oh, but it was a great answer because sure. it was honest, first of all, but also because in order for him to be in my job, I either needed to do so well that I got promoted and there was a gap for him to move into, which also mean I needed to train him well, or I had to be a total failure, in which case I should be out of the way and he should be in my job. So... Uh, it wasn't it wasn't a bad answer. I think the other thing, now that I think about it, and this may come across as strange, is the way I do interviews. <laughs> I will tell people when I'm doing a job interview that there's only one question and the rest of the time we're going to spend together is conversation. The one question I ask is, Romeo and Juliet are dead on the floor. They're lying in a puddle of water and broken glass. There are no marks on the bodies. And you need to determine how they died by asking yes and no questions. You can take as long as you want. You can ask as many as questions as you want. Begin. And what I found is the first time I used that question, again, it was just kind of one of those random things. I was asked to interview potential uh, employees, college graduates. I was supposed to interview and determine their ability to think analytically. And so I used this as a lead-in question, just kind of an icebreaker. But what I've discovered as I use that question is within about 10 minutes, you can determine how people think. You can determine, I've had people that ask only relational questions. Is the glass on top of the water? Are the bodies on top of the glass? Is the glass on top of the body? Are the bodies touching each other? You have people that ask only factual questions. Is the glass fragment clear? Is it bigger than uh, a dollar bill? Are the bodies juxtaposed or, or, or perpendicular to each other, just fact gathering questions, right? And so you start to see how people's thought processes work. And I've even blown away some HR people by asking this question and then 10 minutes later saying to the candidate, you're an independent thinker who doesn't trust other people's opinions. And you've probably within your career stepped on a few toes because of that. And their eyes get really big. And the HR person says, wait a minute, it took me 45 minutes to get there. And you got there in 10. And I'm just saying, because all I'm doing is watching the way this person thinks hmm. and listening to the questions they ask, which is very much really a gaming concept. Because the game right. lets you act, and then the game responds to the way you act, and then you build patterns, and the game responds based on the patterns many times. But yeah, that, that one question has been a game changer for me in interviewing people. Because typically what happens in an interview is, talk to me about a time when you had a conflict with a team member and you had to resolve it. Or, you know, this situation comes up and how are you going to respond? People prepare for those questions. I want to see them think. I want to see and, and listen to the way they think and listen to the way they process information and see if they give up. Right? I had one guy that I was hiring as a, as a, in a consulting role who actually didn't ask any questions. He just posed theories. And this was a guy I really wanted to hire. But as a consultant, that would have been terrible because he'd have come in with preconceived notions all the time. Mm. I think those are the two big ones. That, you know, that interview notion of seeing how people think by asking that question that they're not ready for. And then this idea of understanding the motivation of my people and what is it that they want to accomplish. And so how can I bring those together, the way they think and what they want to accomplish to align with our goals and to align what I can provide as a leader with their goals? That's that's a really interesting approach. That's I find that question to be really fascinating. How have you um, continued to use some of what you discover in those interviews down the road? 
or do you? Oh, you do. Because now I know how I'm going to communicate to you. I know, for example, there are people that you can see, they will ask about three questions about mm -hmm. Romeo and Juliet, and then they'll stop. And if you watch closely, you know that they're internal processing and they're putting those things together. And then the next question, almost always, if someone is reacting this way, the next question almost always is a question that's used to validate a theory. So they take their fact gathering questions, they process, then they ask a, a, a theory proving question. I know down the road that if I'm in a meeting and that person is sitting in the back being very quiet, it doesn't mean that they're disengaged. It means they're taking the information they've got, and in a minute, they're going to ask one question that proves a theory that they're putting together in their head. So as I learn about the way people interact, I may have another person who's just rapid-firing questions, right? Going and going and going and going and going and going. That person probably processes thoughts externally. They process thoughts out loud. Again, if I'm in a meeting and that person is asking a bunch of questions, they're not trying to be a jerk. It's just how they process the information. And so I learned that in the interview as I'm building the team. And then as we're in meetings down the road and I, I, I've now learned a bit about how they process, I, I don't have to guess. I know that the, the thought approaches that they're going to use, I know even before I go into the meeting that if somebody has asked all relational questions, the, the question I can expect out of them in the meeting is, how does this initiative relate to the other ones we've got in the pipeline today? Hmm. So what's been the strangest answer you've ever received to that particular question? Well, you get people that go way down the road, right? They're trying to figure out how Romeo and Juliet died. And I won't give you the answer because I don't want to blow it for people. I had one woman say, did they drink poison? No. Did um, they drown? No. I give up. Okay, well, hang on. Um, this, I told you this is the only question. And you don't have to get it right. I just want to engage in how you think. Yeah, I give up. Okay, well, I'll still pay for lunch, but the interview's over and you don't get the job. <laughs> Unless you want to ask more questions. I had another guy, and, and I can't, can't really tell you what he was asking, but he was right at the tipping point. He had everything he needed right in front of him, and it took him another 20 minutes asking all around the barn, and he didn't get the job either. That, that, <laughs> that was frustrating. I had one person say... After about 10 minutes, hey, can I call a friend? I think I have a friend that knows this. Can I call him? Well, if I'm hiring a, a consultant, what a great answer that is, right? This is someone who's going to go to external resources. Right. So um, it's, it's always fascinating and it's always interesting when you see people try and solve that puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, the way they ask, the way they might may or may not get frustrated. Uh, I had one person at the end of it who eventually got the right answer say, I think you've just discovered more about me than anybody has ever in any interview that I've ever done. Mm. I said, that's because everybody else just asks your name, your work history, and your GPA. So let me ask you this. As we look at leadership, leadership is rife with challenge, mm -hmm. especially for those who, who are interested in this concept and are looking to get their feet wet or maybe have found themselves in a role where they're managing a team, but they don't necessarily have a lot of experience. What are some of the ways you recommend newer leaders or leaders that are experiencing some really difficult challenges early on? What would you recommend? What would you say to encourage them? And what should they keep their eye on as they're starting down this path? There are a couple of keys that you've already hit on in some of the questions you asked. One is I, I've got to be willing to set and ready to set clear goals for the team. This is what we need to accomplish. I need to set some clear pathways on how we're going to get there. I, ca I can't leave it all open to random choice for everybody on the team. I think one of the catchphrases that I tend to remember and rely on is that people would much rather or much find it much easier to edit than to create. So as a leader, I want to start with an idea rather than starting with a blank canvas that says, hey, what are all the ideas you think? Because if I allow people to throw up all their ideas and, and some of them get really married to a couple of them and I don't choose those, I've set, I've set my team up for failure. So I want to start with some concepts and some ideas on the board and allow us to edit those rather than free form throwing everything up. And then it's back to that idea of understanding the motivation and the direction of my people. Now there are times when the motivation and direction of your people don't align with the motivation and direction of the team. And that's always the, I think for leaders, that's always the hardest is figuring out how do I have this communication with someone that where this might not be a fit. And in, and in that, if, again, if you've got the goal and you've got the processes we're gonna to use to accomplish the goal, then I can come back to the person who's not a fit and, and talk about, do you agree with the goal? Do you agree with the past? Where are we not meshing, right? I, it becomes a much less emotional conversation and more of a factual conversation. 
So I think those are those are the keys, really. Those three: know the goal, establish the path to accomplish the goal, so that your people are editing and not creating, and then know your people. All right. Well, I want to talk about one more thing. I happened to have the great pleasure of reading a little blog post that uh, you had written before. And you actually use some metaphors, taking looks at things that happen in real life, and specifically it was in your family, and uh, video games. Yeah, my wife and I attended a Love and Respect conference, which is the name of a book uh, by the Egg Riches. And the, the concept in the conference was that women want love and men want respect. And they listed uh, several attributes of what that meant. Desires that men have, desire for, for working shoulder to shoulder, desire for overcoming a struggle or a challenge, desire for um, goal accomplishment. And what struck me in the conference, and this is what I said in the blog post, is that I see all of those happening for my kids, my boys, in video games. When I get to play online and sit down with a friend and we try and accomplish a goal or overcome an obstacle, there's a level of respect that is generated there. When I sure. um, get an achievement and I'm ranking up within a game, there's a level of respect that is afforded there. And then when we as parents come storming down, in our case, into the basement and unplug the game, you know what was interesting to us is the level of anger that we got. Before we understood this concept, the level of anger was really, we're thinking you're playing a game to escape doing homework, and I'm telling you, you have to get off the game, and, and the anger was explosive. What we failed to understand, I think, was that there was a level of respect my kids were getting out of gaming. And in the context of this conference, they were talking to wives and how wives can provide that respect, help provide that respect for their husbands. Well, my, my kids are in middle school and high school. They don't have wives. In fact, at the time, they didn't even have girlfriends. So where are you going to find that? Where are you going to build on those desires that make you feel respected? And gaming was providing that. And so it really changed the way we interacted with our kids' gaming habits. It didn't, it didn't mean we were going to let them turn into couch potatoes. But it did mean that we were going to respect what they got out of the game and try and build some of those same mechanisms that I talk about in leadership. What's the goal? Well, the goal is I want my kids to be respected, and I now understand they get it from the game. What's the process mm -hmm. to achieve the goal? Well, I'm going to set some boundaries on game time and, and other things that have to be achieved for you to allow for the game time. But then when you're in it, I'm going to let it's hands off. Go. Play. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Know that we have a process we have to adhere to, but go get it. And then I'm going to enter in and have that conversation with them so that I know them well. What are the games that you really like? What are the games, what are the parts of that game that you really like? And then, sure enough, almost every game now that my kids play, I get sucked into. I used to be just a sports gaming guy, on the, particularly on Xbox for a long time. But I had one son pulled me into the Call of Duty series. I had another son that pulled me into um, Halo. And then uh, that same son pulled me into to Assassin's Creed. And... and through conversation with them and understanding that process on where we allow gaming and understanding the goal and what they were getting out of it. Now we've built relationship on even different levels because we have those games that are our thing, mm -hmm. which of course means that it's easy for them on my birthday or Christmas, they buy me a game and then they go play a variety <laughs> of them. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. Uh, you know, the uh, the concept behind the love and respect, as you, you dig into it, resonated with me. And, and I think about it even just as a guy and, and those um, those benefits that, that we typically receive from gaming does check a lot of those boxes. I, I've learned that I also have to be cautious that I can't let that be my only source right. of respect, which is, is the tough thing. I mean, this is, you know... <laughs> If there are ladies out there listening, this is this is tough because you have a very structured, perfect world that, that checks all the right boxes. And uh, very rarely does it, it miss some of these elements you described in terms of, you know, recognition and, and that feedback and that camaraderie when you're playing with your friends that, you know, you're doing something big together. It, it can be easy and very tempting to allow that to be a substitute. Yes. Which is unfortunate. I don't usually like to go there with some of the negative aspects, but my, my positive launch for this is, is looking for ways that we can script this into our reality. And if we're a leader, I strongly believe as a leader, it's up to us to find a way to create these same wins for our team at work. Absolutely. Even if it's just with coworkers, even if we're not in a formal leadership role, if you can take this idea of how do you create a group win – how do you create this sense of camaraderie? How do you build in some of these common respect elements? Everyone around you will be better for it. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And I, I, as you know, we talked earlier in the week, I'll even break that down, right? When you think about simplistically, what is a mechanism I can use to put that into place um, within, mm -hmm. within a corporate structure? What I've always said, and I use this in a lot of the work that I do now, is that if you think about a gaming achievement or something that the game wants me to accomplish, and let's, let's even narrow that down to not the main goal of the game, but some of these side goals, these achievements, if you will. There's three components. There's a request, the thing the game wants me to do. There's a reward when I accomplish that thing, and there's a level of recognition. And so we talk about that with loyalty programs, but it also works in terms of, of kind of employee motivation and employee reward. There are things that I'm going to request my team members do. When they accomplish that, I'm going to reward it. And when I reward it, I'm also going to provide a level of recognition. And sometimes the recognition is reward in, enough, uh, in and of itself. But we all like a little reward now and again, too. And then especially in the real world, right? In the gaming world, <laughs> I just want the badge. Yeah. I just want the recognition. Sure. sure. In the real world, I probably want the reward, too. Well, and I think another thing you, you said within there, what makes it work is that's not the final goal of playing a game. Right. You're, you're working your way towards something much bigger. And, and too many times I've seen workplaces that just talk about the mission and the vision and no one discusses, okay, what do we do today or what do we do next week or what do we do by the end of the month to get there? Well, our goal is just to do this. And, and that can be very demotivating because those kind of goals don't happen overnight. And if there's no way to track that progress, you, you kind of find yourself checking out a bit. Yeah, we, we actually worked for an organization um, whose name I won't use, but, but wanted us to get to the point where our, in effect, our, our revenues were doubled. And this is in the, this would have taken us from the hundreds of millions into the billions. So they wanted us to get to the point where our revenues were doubled within five years. Now, we ran a bunch of models, and, and this was just a goal that was pulled out by the executive. We ran a bunch of models in the marketing department and couldn't come up with a model that would do it without significantly changing the way we went to market or significantly changing our cost structure. But we're constantly told again and again, nope, that's the goal, nope, that's the goal, nope, that's the goal. <laughs> so there were a lot of wheels that were spun and a lot of time spent developing these test models to see if we could come up with one that was going to work, but getting nothing other than this is the corporate goal. There was no there was no help to get to milestones. There was no thinking about changing spending to get to milestones. There was It was just, we anticipate that it's going to happen and it's not going to be necessarily organic. There will be a hockey stick. And the people who had been tasked in the organization with knowing that were saying, we don't see it. How do you expect we're going to get there? And the executive just kept saying, no, we will. So you're right. There are times when we set a big goal out there, but we don't do those those interim moves to help people get it, to help people move to it. All right. Well, let me just ask you this one more question. I'm curious who out there is uh, a person, a group, anything under the sun pretty much that's that's interesting to you right now? That's a great question. The things that are kind of stirring in me lately are really kind of this notion of people leadership and looking. I see a lot of writing on that, those that kind of that front end. How do you set better goals? Um, that motivate people? How do you create better processes to help people get there? But the piece that I that is really kind of turning my crank right now is this people piece because I, I see it as a whole. And how do I motivate people? A lot of the work that I do, as I said, is in customer experience. So I help companies figure out how to motivate customers. But figuring out how we motivate our employees, how we motivate those that we have given responsibility to lead, how do I motivate my own kids, my <laughs> two boys going off to college, <laughs> That kind of people motivation piece, I think, is something that's really in, in the forefront for me these days. Looking at, looking to find kind of the balance between gamification and play theory feels a little psychological and a little manipulative sometimes. And, sure. and this structured kind of seven habits to instill that will make you a better leader the, this people equation, which is the messy piece in the middle, that's that's what's really kind of drawing me these days. Are there any success stories in the gamification world that uh, stand out in your mind as being notable? They're they're a little bit anecdotal, but I have I have seen a couple things lately that have been specific to movie releases. Where and I th I think the one that most readily comes to mind is some of the online work that was done in the the. Um, leading up to the release of the first of the Hunger Games films, where the website was asked, I mean, there, were, there was that notion of achievements all through the website. It was almost like a game in and of itself. But every step you took, you were being rewarded with the opportunity, with the end opportunity being to get an invite to a pre-screening of the film. 
So there was this kind of end goal that was a little bit motivating enough, especially for those of us that have read the books. But the feedback loops that they built into the website were phenomenal in the way that what you did made a difference in your community. So not only am, am I personally going to get a win, but the Denver area is going to get a win because I'm one of the ones responding, which now leads me to tell my other friends in Denver, hey, get on and do this thing and participate and let's share this back and forth. It was actually one of the most brilliant uses of gamification I've ever seen. Um, and I've seen that start to spread to other kind of pre-release. Let's build excitement for this movie before it comes out. And it, it was it was so well done that I actually looked up some of the creators of it and started, you know, kind of commenting and giving them kudos in social media because it, it went beyond just how do we make this entertaining to how am I leveraging that entertainment to build a bigger audience and to build a bigger swell for the release of this film. All right, so what's the best way for people to stay connected with you and follow some of what you're up to? My blog site is curtisofletcher.com, C-U-R-T-I-S-O-F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R.com. That's where I'm posting a lot lately, especially on this leadership people piece. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. It's almost all that Curtis O. Fletcher, Instagram, all the, you know, kind of the, the prime social media outlets. You can find me there, too. And generally, somewhere in there, I've slipped up and let my e personal email address and my cell phone number go. So you, you don't have to be on one of those for very long <laughs> before you can probably get directly to me as well. Outstanding. I really appreciate your time today and just your, your candidness as well as your expertise in these areas. And I, I appreciate the insight and parallels you bring to your work. I certainly hope your, your sons enjoy that as well. <laughs> they do. In fact, I'm, I'm anticipating I'll probably hear from my son out in California within the next couple hours wanting to jump on Diablo 3. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Curtis, thank you. My pleasure.